Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled The Teachings of Jesus. It's a very interesting series. This is lesson number five in that series entitled How to Be Saved. I mean, what more do you need to know, right? This lesson is for August 2, 2014. And I hope you have your Bible handy because you want to make sure that what we're quoting is what it actually says. And I hope now that you've got your Bible in your hand, hopefully, we're going to ask you to bow your head with us as we begin with a word of prayer. Our loving Father, this lesson is a auspicious, has an auspicious title. We look forward to studying it together. May it give us insights into the simple steps to the plan of salvation. And may the Holy Spirit and Jesus himself press those truths home to our hearts as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we learn just from the teachings of Jesus how to be saved? Or do we need more help? Well, there are several very interesting stories in the Gospels. We're going to spend quite a bit of time with the story of Nicodemus in chapter 3 of the Gospel of John. Um, Jesus referred back to an experience the Israelites had near the end of their wanderings through the wilderness. Now, you may remember that uh, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling body like a Congress uh, for the Jewish people. There were some 70 men and no women in those days. Uh, in that august body, and Nicodemus was a part of it. And after nearly 40 years of having all their needs, talking about the experience back with the children of Israel, after nearly 40 years of having all their needs met by God, water, food, care, etc., whatever, God decided to, they, they were still complaining about the food and the water. So God decided to take away some of the protections and blessings he had provided and see how they would respond. He stopped protecting them from the deadly snakes that inhabited that area. Now, unfortunately, if you only read the story in Numbers, you might think, hey, why is God sending all those snakes? But Moses knew better. Remember, Moses had lived in that area for years back when he was herding sheep. He knew about the natural snakes in that area. And he said in Deuteronomy 8, verse 15, he led you... To, uh, no, Moses is now talking to the children of Israel. He's talking about God. He led you through that vast and terrifying desert where there were poisonous snakes and scorpions. In that dry and waterless land, he made water flow out of solid rock for you. So it wasn't that God sent the snakes. He just stopped protecting them from the snake. Well, you know what happened. Moses was instructed to produce a bronze snake, a bronze serpent, and place it up on a cross. Why do you think God would ask Moses to do a thing like that? Doesn't it sound kind of like producing an idol? It does. It does. And I will tell you that if you go on to read carefully in the writings of Ellen White, they preserved that thing and some people were worshiping it way down after the days of David and Solomon. Mm -hmm. So that was the result. Well, So why did God has to ask, ask him to produce that snake? Well, on the stick. On a the good cross. question. A good, a fair question. There's two or three things we need to understand about it for sure. One, I know hopefully, hopefully no one here and no one listening has any question about the fact that a bronze serpent can't do anything. We know that that serpent cannot do anything, could not do anything. So what happened? Because the story clearly goes on to say that people who looked got well. The people who didn't bother said, hey, that snake can't do anything. I'm not going to bother. They died. So what was God trying to teach them? What was the symbolic yeah. aspect of that? Symbolic of what? The well, God I don't know. Is that, that's what I was thinking, what your yeah. question was. What did it symbolize? Yeah. What did the snake the, on the cross symbolize? Yeah. Okay. The snake didn't symbolize anything. It was just a asked to do something and see if they would respond and follow instruction. Yeah. Uh, beyond that, I think we might be reading too much into it. If you arbitrary request? 
possibly a requirement to to not die from the snake bite in certain circumstances it might be I don't know. We haven't. I don't well, know. I mean, God's way of pointing out that they really still needed him, regardless of what they might have thought. The question is, after 40 years, and God provides everything for you, and He says, "I'm challenging you with one thing. And I want you to look at that snake." If you say no, what what are you saying about your relationship with God? But why a snake? Rock yeah. Rock. Why a snake? That's uh, you because know, it was that, snake that was being devil that they were that biting back in Genesis. You know, yeah. it's, the snakes well, were biting them. Yeah, that's the two things I see. I see the cross and yeah. I see the the serpent. Yeah, I see both of them together. So yeah. what does that mean? There must mm -hmm. be a meaning there. Yeah. Well, of course, the question is now, in light of our lesson, does looking it just with our mind's eye? Because obviously we can't look literally. In our mind's eye, if we look at the death of Christ on the cross, can that save us? Can it? What can looking at the cross do for us? That's the real question. We're not looking at serpents now. We're looking in our mind's eye. We can't see it literally, but we, in, in, in imagination, we see Jesus hanging on the cross. What can that do for us? It's not a magical act yeah. mm -hmm. that I'm convinced of. Okay but it might turn our minds to Jesus and to okay. what God has done, what Jesus has done. Okay. Okay, and, and don't you think that those who looked at the snake said, I know the snake is not healing me, God has healed me? Well, Maybe some of them did, but I bet a lot of them Maybe did. the ones who did, <laughs> who looked actually did. Well, there's a few things we need to make very clear. There are many verses in the Bible. For example, look at Psalm 14.3. They have all gone wrong. They're all equally bad. Not one of them does what is right, not a single one. Guess who's that talking? That is talking about? Humans. Everybody. Human beings. Ecclesi I like Ecclesiastes 7, verse 20. There is no one on earth who, who does what is right all the time and never makes a mistake. Of course, the famous verse that everybody knows that says basically the same thing is um, Romans 3.23. Uh, there's other ones listed here in case you uh, want to look them up. Everyone has sinned and is far away from God's saving presence. Which brings me to this point. If you are interested in our handouts that we use in our class here, you're free to get them. Look at our website, theox .org, theox. Theox org. you can get the same handouts that we use for our classes here. Well, it should be painfully obvious that throughout Scripture we are told that we are sinners, and thus without a miraculous change, we are doomed to die. So, we're we're, we're, we've got a deadly disease called sin, and if we do nothing, we die. Are those things clear right up front? Okay. Satan hopes to so blind us spiritually that we cannot or even will not look to the cross. Look at an example of that found in John 9, verses 40 and 41. Now this is at the end of a long story where Jesus heals a blind man and he does it when? What day? On the Sabbath. On the, what a dreadful thing to do. He healed the man on the Sabbath. Can you imagine it? Well, some Pharisees who were there with him heard him say this. He had said uh, just before that, Jesus said, I came to this world to judge so that the blind should see and those who see should become blind. And guess who jumped on the bandwagon? Some Pharisees who were there with him heard him say this and asked him, surely you don't mean that we are blind too? Jesus answered, if you were blind, then you would not be guilty. But since you claim that you can see, this means that you are still guilty. What was Jesus trying to say? They were the willing blind, is what I've written in here before. Yes, the willing blind. What does that mean? Well, he, was, he was getting at them with the same thing that he opened up to Nicodemus when mm -hmm. Nicodemus finally got there. He told him the same thing. Mm -hmm in a slightly different way, but there's no misjudging what it was about. Okay, so back to our premise here. We're all sinners. We all should die. The only chance 
for I have any improvement on that situation is to recognize our status. If you're blind, how good are you at seeing things? Not. No. If you're willfully blind, it's even worse, right? So Jesus is saying, if you claim that you can see, but you obviously can't, what does that mean? You're willfully blind, right? Well, it's just like if you, if you don't think you're sick, you're not going to call a doctor. Right. Luke 5, 31 and 32 basically says the same thing. People who are well do not need a doctor, but only those who are sick. I have not come to call respectable people to repent, but outcasts. And that was Jesus at the fair at Matthew's feast, as if I remember correctly. The Pharisees to whom he was speaking thought that they were righteous and did not need any help. What basis was there for thinking they were righteous? Because they were healthy, wealthy. Well, even more than that. And rulers. They were descendants of Abraham, and they were Pharisees. I mean, that's a guaranteed ticket on two counts, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. The tax collectors and sinners who went to Matthew's feast recognized their need, and they were helped. So, do I dare bring the discussion to our day? How many Christians today really recognize their spiritual need? Do we just give lip service to the idea that we're sinners? Jesus had a hard time teaching even his disciples that the Pharisees' behavior could not win eternal life for them. Think about it. The, and the disciples, up until basically the time when Jesus, you know, died, and they realized, hey, there's, there's a change in the change in the plans here. They were inclined to believe what the Pharisees taught as opposed to what Jesus taught. And here's God himself walking around with them, and he couldn't seem to get through to them. Why are we so... Is it so difficult for us to unlearn things we think we know? In fact, it probably wasn't until the resurrection that they had a paradigm change. Yeah. And then it only started. Between yeah. the resurrection and the, Pentecost. And, and the Pentecost, things really, really changed. Well, for hundreds of years, and now here's, here's, here's what we're dealing with, folks. For hundreds of years, the Christian church has taught the idea that in the judgment, God will balance our good deeds and our bad deeds against each one, one against the other. And if the good deeds outweigh the bad deeds, we can be saved. But of course, if the bad deeds out, outweigh the good deeds, what happens? You go to hell, right? Jesus categorically rejected that idea. I mean, basically that's saying, if you do enough good things, what are you doing? You're earning your own salvation, right? Yeah. He told us that only the Holy Spirit working in our minds and transforming us from unrepentant sinners into followers of Jesus, repent disciples, can possibly bring eternal life. Only the Holy Spirit can bring eternal life. Unfortunately, in Revelation, John described that final church in history. Remember what the final church is called? Laodicea. Laodicea. And what does Laodicea think of itself? You did nothing. Pretty well off. I'm rich and well off. Just like us. Just, we are. I mean, look at us. We have nice shirts and nice tie. And I mean, what more could we ask for, right? And what does God say about us? We're poor and naked and blind, according to my Good News translation. Trouble. Could that really be true about us? Now, there, there are two ways to look at that passage. And I'd like you to think about this now. Does that last church, that Laodicean church, does that apply to all people who claim to be Christians in the last days? So therefore, maybe our small group of Adventists are the good ones in that big pie, most of whom are lost. Or could this Laodicean church apply primarily to Seventh-day Adventists, and we got a problem. Don't everybody speak at once. Say, how can you really split it when we also believe there's going to be other people in heaven, and they can't all be just borderline Christians. There's mm -hmm. got to be some that are really into it. Okay, so... And yet, by definition, the final church will be the final church, and yeah. Jesus will come. Mm-hmm. Well, only the Holy Spirit can produce a change in us that will bring about salvation. 
Fortunately, God is a perfect physician. Holy Spirit, Jesus, Father, any of them. They are perfect physicians. The Holy Spirit has never lost a case of a person who honestly and sincerely asks for help. Now, that should be easy, right? What's the problem? I mean, can't we just... I mean, remember the four... What, what, what were those called? The four laws of salvation or something like that? Four spiritual laws that people used to talk about. One, two, three, four. Bang. Do you believe? Yes. Okay, you're saved. Couldn't that be simple? Well, recognizing our need is not the only thing necessary, unfortunately. Biblical repentance includes three things. One, we must first recognize our own sinfulness. We've talked about that, and, and a fair number of people are willing to recognize that. Then two, we must recognize the damaging effects of sin and be truly sorry for the sin itself and not just its results. And three, we must really stop, or really desire to stop sinning. Not just hope that we can sin without reaping the results. One of the saddest stories in Scripture is the story of Judas, who had every imaginable privilege and opportunity even after spending years with Jesus, he thought he knew what was good for himself and for Jesus better than God did. Can you imagine that? Later, he was sorry for the results, but not sorry for his sin. John the Baptist, Jesus, and the disciples all started their messages to the crowds with an appeal to repent. Why do you suppose that was the first? I mean, you can look at the Matthew 3, 2, Matthew 4, 17, Mark 6, 12, Acts 2, 38, 3, 19. This is repeated in many places. Why would the first thing you say is repent? If you don't repent, you die in the long run. Okay. What does it mean to repent? Turn around, change direction. Yeah. Exactly. If you've got people going in the wrong direction, what do you say? Keep going in the wrong direction? <laughs> You know, you tell them to turn around, right? That's what it means to repent. Sin pays its wage. The wage is death. Romans 6, 23 and Luke 13, 1 to 5, a couple of story that spells that out. But a clear understanding of God's plan for our lives and a recognition of his goodness leads to repentance. Romans 2, 4. Maybe we should just look at that real quickly. Romans 2, 4. Or perhaps you despise his great kindness, tolerance, and patience. Surely you know that God is kind because he's trying to lead you to repent. God's kindness is supposed to lead us to repentance. Now, how would that work? How does God's kindness lead us to repent? Well, if you're running away from God as fast as you can go, and you get an idea that behind you is someone who really cares about you, really is nice, he wants to help you, might that influence you to turn around? Sure. If, you have to, if you're willing to observe and listen and take instruction, mm -hmm. then he can do something for you. Okay. It's kind of hard to answer that unless you have a, yeah. a what do you call it, an example? Mm -hmm. An example? Oh. Yeah, one of the, well, yeah, example. Good question. Well, it's interesting. Ellen White said this in Christ's Object Lessons, page 189. We do not repent in order that God may love us, but he reveals to us his love in order that we may repent. Now, what does that mean? Well, if he's revealing it, we have to observe it. And mm -hmm. we have to we have an affinity for it or to like it. If we reject it, then not much he can do for us. Mm -hmm. Well, when sinners begin to recognize their true condition and turn around and ask for divine help and salvation, the Holy Spirit comes to their aid because Jesus says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. What does that mean? I'm asking lots of questions here. What does that mean? What is it? This is supposed to be the simple solution to salvation here, folks. Maybe you got the answer out there. 
Romans 14, 23 is an interesting verse that sheds some light on all this. Look at that, Romans 14, 23. Now, if you remember the chapter of Romans 14, it's Paul's discussion about whether or not it's all right to eat food that's been offered to idols. And he goes back and forth and he talks about various issues that are involved. And then he concludes with these words, verse 23. But if they have doubts about what they eat, God condemns them when they eat it. Because their action is not based on faith, and anything that is not based on faith is sin. Now, what does that verse mean? Can we break that down a little bit? Is he saying it's a sin to eat meat? Is he saying it's a sin to eat something offered to an idol? What's the sin involved here? Your thoughts in relation to the situation. Exactly. If you think you're, what you're doing is wrong, it probably, it's probably damaging you even if, if it may not be wrong. It's what goes on. The sin goes on in here, not what goes on in your mouth. Okay? So when we do something that we have questions about or we, we think we shouldn't, but we want to do it anyway, the sin's already there, right? So what we're saying then is faith and sin are opposites. How, in what way? Sin takes us further and further away from God. Faith moves us closer and closer to God. Those are opposite directions, right? Wouldn't that be fair? Death or salvation. Mm -hmm. Well, look at Luke 8, verse 12. Get my... The seeds... Now you remember, this is a story about the, the farmer who's casting seed. The seeds that fell along the path stand for those who hear, but the devil comes and takes the message away from their hearts in order to keep them from believing and being saved. What's the devil trying to do? Takes away the good things that they were being taught. He, it, he's their... going to do everything he can to keep us from receiving the truth. Yep. Right? Yep. Deceiving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is faith? We've talked a little bit about faith. My mentor, Dr. A. Graham Maxwell, put this definition together. We, he gradually grew, grew over the years as he was talking about it, and I, I really like it, so I think it's, it's one of the best I've ever seen. Faith is just a word we use. There's no magic to that particular combination of letters. It's a different... In Greek, it's pistis. Uh, in other language, it's imani and swahili that I know. But faith is just a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with a person well known. The better we know him, the better the relationship may be. Not we can't say will be because who's the best example of someone who knew God very well and it didn't turn out to be a good relationship? Satan. Satan. Lucifer. Yeah. So faith implies an attitude toward God of love, trust, and deepest admiration. It means having enough confidence in God based on more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing to believe what he says as soon as we are sure he's the one saying it, to accept what he offers as soon as we are sure he is the one offering it, and to do what he wishes as soon as we are sure he is the one wishing it, with all without reservation, for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith would be perfectly safe to save. That is why faith is the only requirement for salvation or for heaven. Faith also means, here's an interesting addition, faith also means that like Abraham and Moses, God's friends, we know God well enough to reverently ask him why. Now why do you suppose he added those la that last paragraph? You have to know someone very well in order to point out or to ask personal questions. Okay. Good point. You want to add anything, Gordon? When, when you ask why, you're looking for understanding. You're not just saying, yes, you've said it, Master, I will do it. You're asking, well, I don't understand what this means. Explain it to me, please. Mm -hmm. And what has been the traditional understanding of faith down through the generations? 
believe in some dark. Anything that God says, I just do it. I don't have to ask. I don't have to ask any questions. If God said it. I do it. That's that's the way it is. We even have songs about it, don't we? The danger is the devil is going to come as God, and tell us to do things that we definitely should not. Yes, exactly. To believe even things that we definitely should not. But when Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, does that, does that have to do with faith? Does sure. faith start out as a mustard seed? And, in, and at that point, are you safe to save? Yes. What, what did, I mean, what's your understanding of what, 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 what was he trying to say about a mustard seed? Put it well, that it's way. the smallest of all seeds that get planted and it grows into a shrub, but the bush is... Pretty good sized the, bush. The birds so, so what's, the yeah, so what's the, what's the characteristic of this mustard seed? It grows. A fantastic capacity to grow. Okay. Okay? So, faith like a mustard seed doesn't mean it's infinitesimally small. Faith like a mustard seed says it has a fantastic capacity to grow. Okay, so what if you get planted in the ground and you haven't germinated yet and something happens and you, you die? God, God, will, you okay? God, will, God will take care of that. He knows how to deal with that. Well, you know the verse in Acts 16, 31, where Paul was talking to that Philippian jailer. What had happened, remember that Paul and Silas were put in prison. There's some evidence that the, they, were, they, were, they were locked probably in, in some kind of stocks, maybe a 45 degree angle with their arms tied down and their feet tied down with heavy iron bars of some kind. And what were they doing? Singing. Singing. I mean, what else could you do? How could you sleep like that? You know, you're on a cold rock with your arms and your legs tied out, I mean semi-crucified. So they're singing. And then all of a sudden there's this horrendous earthquake and the jailer thinks that all the prisoners have escaped and he's going to kill himself. And they said, no, don't do it. Everyone's still here. And then he said, what must I do to be saved? Which probably meant, what must I do to be safe? <laughs> and uh, what did they say to him? He said, you don't have to do anything except believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your family. And they preached the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. It must have been a very interesting evening, or well, I should say night, right? Well, um, what are the things that contribute to faith? How do we they were baptized that same night. Yep. Or that Next morning, anyway. So what are the things that, in practical terms, what are the things that contribute to our faith? If faith is a relationship with God, how do we make that grow? We're talking about your mustard seed now, Gary. How do we make it grow? Bible study. Bible study is number one. It's where loving your neighbor as yourself uh, comes in and okay, that's, your own experience is supposed to be growing. It seems like, to me, faith is one of the basic bricks, but there's a few more things to add to it, to salvation. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's bio, the, the things that we do, the part that we play, Bible study, prayer. prayer, and witnessing. Those are the only three things that the Bible tells us that we actually need to do. Now, we can understand why Bible study would be necessary. That seems sort of, sort of obvious, right? If we, get, we want to get to know God, you sort of read the Bible. Prayer seems semi-obvious, at least, because you'd say, well, God, I've learned something, you know, help me to figure out how to incorporate this in my life. Where does the witnessing come in? What, what does that do for us? It helps us learn. Well, it says faith without works is dead. Okay. So it's but a combination. Is this, is it, are we you, just trying to earn our way? When you speak to no. someone else, you have to be able to verbalize you know, and I have a difficult time with that. I need to do it more because the more you speak something, the more you feel comfortable and it flows and you understand. And if okay. somebody questions you, you have to be able to answer it. In order to teach, you really have to know it. That's exactly the point. We have to, if we really want to know, if you really want to know whether you understand something, try to explain it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's what it's all about. God says, okay, practice. 
And it's not just for the person you're witnessing to, but you may not even help him very much. You may discover how much you don't know. I, I never forget in my mind, this was 45 years ago. In fact, more than that, it was 47, 48 years ago when I was in medical school and I was attending one of Dr. Maxwell's classes. We talked about why Jesus had to die. And I already had a degree in theology before I came to medical school. And I had never heard anyone explain it like that. And I was so excited about it. We were on a, headed out on a Friday afternoon going to the beach for a, a beach vespers for, the, for a bunch of medical students. And so I had several people in my car says, oh, I'm so excited. Today we learned in class, da da da, about why, why Jesus had died. Well, okay, well, explain it to us. And I started out and then I couldn't figure out how I got from here to there to there. And you just feel dumb. But boy, you can be sure I'd, I knew by the next time I tried to explain it to somebody, I figured it out. Yeah. So that's, that's why we need to do that. We need, we need to practice. And then, then if you have a problem with some of the Bible texts that mm -hmm. have been messed up, and then it makes it even more difficult. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, having faith in Jesus means that when we are tempted, what, sh what are we supposed to do? <clears throat> Stop and think. And we, we should learn from Eve here. Just think how different things would have been if Eve had said, you know, what you say about this tree might be correct. I'm not arguing with you. Maybe it's correct. But let me go discuss it with my husband and with God, and I'll come back. The tree will be here tomorrow. If the fruit is that good, I, I can have some tomorrow. You know. How often do we talk like that to ourselves? This deal will never be available again. Yeah. By now, or no. it's not available. Five so minutes from now, it's going sense. away, right? Yeah. yeah. So we need to stop and think about what Jesus wants us to do, what Jesus taught. Two, we must believe that uh, what he said is really for our best good, that God never asked us to do anything which is not for our best good. And then three, we must choose to do his will instead of our own. Now that's not easy for sinful, selfish human beings, but we can do it, and God promises eternal life to those who do do it. Well now, moving on, how does the Holy Spirit involved in all of this? He's willing to help us, but we've got to make some of the first moves. Okay. The Holy Spirit gave us the Bible, gave yes. through, the, through the prophets, through the writers. Clearly, that's one of the main things. Our Bible came to us through the Holy Spirit. He inspired the people to write that book. So clearly, he helps us by providing scriptures for us, first of all. What else does he do? Jesus made this comment, which always puzzled me a little bit. Look at uh, John 16, verse 8. And when he comes, he will prove to the people of the world that they are wrong about sin and about what is right and about God's judgment. Now, if you read one of the more traditional translations, it's even more confusing. Look at the New American Standard Bible. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit is supposed to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. What does that mean? We're all supposed to be experts on this subject, right? In order to make judgment, you have to have the evidence. Mm -hmm. And so it quietly, it's not uh, being force-fed. Mm -hmm. uh, the Holy Spirit may speak, but it's the uh, majority in this day and age have, have the Bible available, but you can't be forced to, to read yeah. it and study it. So we've talked a little bit about the role of the Holy Spirit. Let's just review that a little bit. He, is, he keeps us alive. He's constantly trying to woo us or draw us toward God. And then when he can get our attention enough to actually maybe get us to read our Bible or something like that, he convicts us of sin. And what, what, what is the result when people get convicted of sin? They may feel guilty. And this might be one of the, only, one of the very few times when guilt is a good thing. Right? If it convinces us to change. Well, so now let's see if we can summarize a little bit. Without repentance and turning from our sins, there's only death in our future. If we refuse to repent and give up our old sinful ways, redemption is impossible. 
So now let's go back to Jesus and see what we can learn. After spending a full year in Galilee, healing, teaching, and preaching, Jesus culminated his activities there by feeding the 5,000. You can read about it in John 6. And that was just counting the men. So we estimate there were probably 20,000 people, if you count women and children, there that day. But when they came seeking him the next morning for more of his special food, you know, we had a nice supper last night, what about breakfast? He disappointed them by saying these words, For what my Father wants is that all who see the Son and believe in him should have eternal life, and I will raise them to life on the last day. So what's God, God's wish for us? Eternal life. He wants us to have eternal life. He wants every one of us to have an eternal life. And Jesus says, if you have that kind of relationship with God, I will raise you up in the last, I promise. I will raise you up in the last day. Well, on another, sin, on another occasion, a sinful woman, her name was Mary Magdalene, poured an expensive bottle of perfume on Jesus and kissed his feet, wiping them with her hair. Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Now, we've studied that before. What's the problem with Jesus saying your sins are forgiven? Only God can do that. Only God can forgive sin. So therefore, Jesus is saying, I'm God. And then he went on to say, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So we talked about faith. What does faith do for us? Does faith save us? Leads us to salvation. Okay. Leads us to Jesus. Okay. The little boy who says, I can't do it, but my daddy can. What's he saying? Exercising faith in his father, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not faith that saves us, it's God who saves us. So faith is just that relationship we have with God, and the closer the relationship is, the better we are off, right? Jesus healed a number of people while here on this earth, and he often said to them, your faith has made you well. Matthew 9, 22, Mark 10, 52, Luke 17, 19, for example. We need to recognize, when he said those verses, two important things. One, the word for healing in these verses, in Greek, also means to be saved. So, your faith has made you well could also be, your faith has saved you. Then, two, it is not our action of faith that accomplishes things, but instead it is God's response to our faith. So you could have all the trust in God that you want, have perfect faith in Him, but if He chooses not to heal you at that particular moment, are you going to be healed? Sometimes. Well, not if, not if God says no. You're not going to, I mean, your faith is not going to do anything for you, is what I meant. I, mean, I don't mean it that way. I meant in, in the end. Yeah, yeah. If you, if you could look from the beginning to the end. If right, exactly. You would exactly. understand. So, but the important point is, it's not the faith that does it for us, it's God that does it for us. That's important to notice because when we pray at the bedside of a seriously ill, even dying patient, and that person does not suddenly become well, we must not conclude that it is because of our lack of faith. We must always be humble enough to pray asking for God's will to be done, and God may see things quite differently than we do at that very moment. You may have a different plan. Well, look at Matthew 5.20. I tell you then that you will be able to enter the kingdom of heaven only if you are more faithful, that is, you have more faith, than the teachers of the law and the Pharisees in doing what God requires. What kind of response do you think Jesus got from when he made that statement? I think there was at least some rumbling in the background. <laughs> <laughs> there might have been some gasps, right? Yes. Yes. And what did the, what the people who are not scribes and were not Pharisees, what do you think they thought? There's no way they could ever do that. They didn't know as much as the Pharisees. They didn't have the money. They didn't have the blessings. Right. How is that possible? Yeah. Well, what was the problem with the Pharisees' plan? 
all that wonderful self-righteousness? That was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> they did almost everything they did to be seen of other people. They did it. Hey, look at me, right? And what benefit did they get from that? They got people to look at them, and that's all. <laughs> so in the plan of salvation, our ultimate goal should be to do what is right because it is right, just be, not just because it is pleasing to God. Now, why is that important? Can we figure that out? Even a dog can do what's pleasing to its master. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's what the dog does or what we do when the master isn't looking. Mm -hmm. We do what's right because it is right. So how, how do we get to the place where we learn to do what is right because it is right? Keep trying. Keep looking to God. We, yeah, we, it's not just keeping trying. Some, we need to understand. I mean, you're not going to do what's right because it is right unless you understand why right. it's the right thing to do. So it means this requires some effort on our part to learn the truth, right? And once we really learn that, if you really learn the truth, then you can reach a place where you might be able to say, hey, I'm doing this not because the law says so, not because my church says so, not because my family says so. I'm doing this even, I'm not doing this because God so, says so. I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do. What kind of people do you suppose God will take to heaven? Believers. And in terms of doing right? But they do what's right. I'm just reading here in John 6, 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Yeah, exactly. Well, and belief is he faith. who has faith well, will have that, eternal it, RSV says believes, but it's yeah. belief and faith and trust is all. Well, here's what Ellen White says about that. The man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely. <laughs> Do you know anybody who is keeping the Ten Commandments? Or even, have you ever read about people who keep the Ten Commandments because they think they have to? All those of Jesus' day and many of us today. Because we're required to do that. This is what, this is what you have to do to earn salvation, right? Well, Ellen White says, the man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely because he's required to do so will never enter into the joy of obedience. He does not obey. When the requirements of God are accounted a burden because they cut across human inclination, we may know that the life is not a Christian life. I'm going to do this if it kills me, right? Okay. I'm going to practice health reform if it, even if it kills me, right? True obedience <laughs> is the outworking of a principle within. What is Ellen White saying? She's saying we better understand why exactly this is necessary and then we operate out of principle right it springs from the love of righteousness the love of the law of god the essence of all righteousness is loyalty to our redeemer this will lead us to do right because it is right and then she adds for those who haven't quite got there yet because right doing is pleasing to god christ object lessons pages 97 the bottom and 98 at the top well, she, bees, she gets a little more graphic in another quotation. This is not so easy to find. It's uh, Manuscript 20 of 1897. came from the Signs of the Times, J July 22 of 1897. A sullen submission. Do you know any sullen, sullen submission Christians? Well, think about this. A sullen submission to the will of the Father will develop will not may, might, perhaps, will develop the character of a rebel. I wonder if that has anything to do with rebellion among teenagers. It seems to me there's another area here. There's a difference between the right principle and fanaticism, which is not uncommon in religion. Mm -hmm. In fact, you can end up raving mad. Mm -hmm. You really can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. By such a one, this one who thinks he has to do it, 
such a one's service, this is to God now, is looked upon as drudgery. It is not rendered cheerfully and in the love of God. It is a mere mechanical performance. And then you notice a little bracket, and I'll tell you about the bracket in a moment. If he dared, such a one would disobey. His rebellion is smothered, ready to break out at any time in bitter murmurings and complaints. Such service brings no peace or quiet. And there's the end of the bracket. Such service brings no peace or quietude to the soul. Now, let's say you're St. Peter at the gate, and it's your job to decide who's safe to, enter, to let into the kingdom of heaven. Would you want this person in the kingdom of heaven? Not really. No. Why not? He's First doing what's right. Huh? First opportunity. His rebellion is smothered, ready to break out at any time. It's an infection waiting to come to the surface. He's already been there, done that. Yeah. <laughs> Don't need to do it again. Okay. Well, going on, that was, I, I gave you the quotation. <coughs> Here's another quotation from Ellen White. Desire of Ages 668. Who want to know how having the right kind of relationship with God can change us. All true obedience comes from the heart. In other words, the principle from within, right? It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. What does that mean? That you've listened, you've taken instruction, and then it becomes part of your nature. Yeah, you, you, you recognize that's the right thing to do, and you do it, because it's the right thing to do. The will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight in doing his service. Are they grumpy and grouchy about doing it? No, they're delighted to do it, right? When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Would it be safe to have that kind of person in heaven? Desire of Ages 668. <clears throat> if you've got somebody that sin is hateful to him, you better believe that that person's going to be just fine in heaven. Jesus gave us an interesting parable in Matthew 22 verses 2 to 14. I'll read a little bit of it so that just to remind you. This is the parable of the king who prepared, the kingdom of heaven is like this. Once there was a king who prepared a wedding feast for his son. He sent his servants to tell the invited guests to come to the feast, but they did not want to come. He must not have been a very popular king. So he sent other servants with this message for the guests. My feast is ready now. My bullocks and prized calves have been butchered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But the invited guests paid no attention and went about their business, grabbed, um, one went to his farm, another to his shop, while others grabbed the servants, beat them, and killed them. The king was very angry, so he sent his soldiers who killed those murderers and burnt down their city. So you know what he thought of them as well. Then he called his servants and said to them, my wedding feast is ready, but the people I invited did not deserve it. Now go to the main streets and invite to the feast as many people as you find. So the servants went out in the streets and gathered all the people they could find, good and bad alike, and the wedding hall was filled with people. But the story's not over there. The king went in to look at the guests and saw a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The king asked him. But the man said nothing. No excuses. Then the king told the servants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside in the dark. There he will cry and grind his teeth. Now, what's going on there? Is that the way God likes to treat us? Especially that last part? How do we explain that? There's something you need to know that before you even read this parable, and that's that when a king invites the people from the street into his wedding, son's wedding, he provides free wedding apparel. You weren't expected to have your own. The king knew these guys wouldn't have their own. He provided the garments. So if the king provides them and you don't have one on, what does that mean? It means you've been going in with your own clothes and you're probably okay with that. 
you're okay with that. You're, you're refusing hospitality, right? Disrespect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, in a way, it's like, it's like that person coming in and, and thinking that he's okay. I yeah, mean, yeah, exactly. Not willing to learn, not willing to follow instruction. So I'm what, what does the... My own. What? I'm saved on my own. Yeah. What does the wedding garment represent? Look at a couple of verses in the Bible. Isaiah 61, verse 10. Jerusalem rejoices because of what the Lord has done. She's like a bride dressed for her wedding. God has clothed her with salvation and victory. Who provides the wedding garment? God. And if you read Zechariah 3, 1 to 5, well, I guess maybe we'll have a moment to read that. In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord, and there beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. The angel of the Lord said to Satan, May the Lord condemn you, Satan. May the Lord who loved Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. Joshua was standing there. Joshua was the high priest representing all the people, wearing filthy clothes. The angel said to his heavenly attendants, Take away the filthy clothes this man is wearing. Then he said to Joshua, I have taken away your sin and will give you new clothes to wear. And of course, what does the new clothes represent? Righteousness. Yeah. The righteousness of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Ellen White puts it this way, what is the robe that Christ offers? The robe is the righteousness of Christ, his own unblemished character that through faith is imparted to all who receive him as their personal savior. So how does he impart it? These are all terms you're all supposed to understand here. How does he impart it? By his, this is reading on, by his, that is Jesus' perfect obedience, he has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart, the will is merged in his will, the mind becomes one with his mind, the thoughts are brought into captivity to him, we live his life. Do you know anyone who said he lived that way? Remember Galatians 2.20? I no longer live my own life. I live the life that Christ lives in me, right, Paul? Mm -hmm. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Is that just something slapped on the top of all our wicked sins and so forth just to cover us up? No. No, no it looks like this is a complete transformation, isn't it? Then as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment, remember Adam and Eve, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. Christ Topic Lessons 3.10 and 3.11. Whatever good or righteousness that we can produce is nothing more than filthy rags. Isaiah. Read, read the wrong way, that last paragraph that you read, could say that God is deceived by himself. Yeah, no. And we slip in not if know, you read the part of, not if you read the uh, part of bold yeah. yeah those of us who look to Jesus we like what we see and we we focus on that through bible study and prayer and witnessing more and more and more we are changed by that well the holy spirit gives us this gift the righteousness of Christ as daily we are being changed and we practice giving him access to our minds and our thoughts. We are not asked to make the changes ourselves because we cannot. We give the Holy Spirit access to our thoughts. How do we do that? How do we give the Holy Spirit access to our thoughts? Letting prayer. The Spirit in. Pray. Bible study. Prayer. Put God's ideas into our heads. Uh, we give the Holy Spirit access to our thoughts, and moment by moment, He guides and directs our ways if we allow Him to do so. However, that calls for crucifixion on the part of sinful, our sinful selves. Matthew 4, 22-22. Mark 10, 28. Luke 5, 28. John 8, 30 and 31. Luke 14, 25-27. It's not easy for us. Please note that the phrase to hate in biblical language means to love less. Compare Matthew 10, 37. So, has being a Christian cost you anything? Our lives 
really not seriously. And every step of the process of transformation from being a selfish sinner to being a disciple of Christ, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are active. They help us to recognize our need, to recognize where our help comes from, and to actually make the changes necessary. See Steps to Christ, pages 26 and 27. Some people are naturally self-deprecating. We all know, I'm sure, some like that, that, oh, I can't do anything, I'm no good, I'm whatever. They have feelings of doubt and guilt and worthlessness. Other people are just the opposite. They tend to think they're the best people around. So how does Christianity address the needs of these two different groups? Hopefully it makes them recognize they have to look to Christ on either end. Mm -hmm. Is it important to recognize why Jesus died? Did Jesus die to pay for our sins? Or did his death teach us the consequences of sin? The righteousness which the Holy Spirit can bring to us may be free, but it's not cheap. Heaven risked everything to make it available to us. Are we willing to give up anything for Jesus? What does it mean to take up the cross and follow him? In your own life, can you recognize the various steps that are being discussed in this lesson? Having claimed salvation and yet recognizing your failures as Paul did in Romans 7, can you still rejoice? How can we reach out to others who are total non-believers and convince them that carrying a cross is the right thing to do? Have you ever tried to convince a non-believer that he should carry a cross? Jesus used the example of marriage to describe the Christian experience. And you can't be half married or partially married. It's a full commitment or it's nothing. The disciples of Jesus abandoned everything and followed him. And in the end, they did it gladly. Most of them ended up martyrs. Are we prepared to follow Jesus in that same way? It's interesting that the book of Revelation says the ones who are God's faithful people are the ones who follow him. Follow him how far? All the way to the cross? Are we prepared to at least crucify our sinful selves inside? That's the question we'll leave with you.